Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn presented by Virginia Community Capital. I am Melody Short, Community Innovation Advisor, and I'm excited to have you join us today to learn more about credit building tips for the small business owner. At Virginia Community Capital, we recently discovered that the pandemic has really impacted the credit scores of some of our small business owners within the community. So we felt it was important to one, remind you that credit can be restored, um, but also to bring in subject matter experts to give tips on establishing a strong credit profile. Uh, this is all in an effort to assist you with setting your business up for success. At the end, one of my colleagues will be sharing some valuable information with you uh, with regards to our economic equity fund. So if you're interested in capital resources, we encourage you to stay until the end to learn more about some immediate resources that may be available to you. Um, before we continue, just a few housekeeping rules. We're recording the webinar and uh, we'll send the link to all that register next week. If you have questions, please submit via the Q&A feature located in the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Um, we just ask that you try not to submit via the chat box. Um, and then also, in addition, we always like to team up with community partners uh, when having our lunch and learn sessions to allow them to opportunity to share what resources they may have available through their organization. So before we get right into the lunch and learn, I'd like to introduce one of our community partners, the Metropolitan Business League, being represented today by the development, uh, the business development manager, Michael White. Good, 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 good. Great afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael White with the Metropolitan Business League. and just want to say it's such an honor to be a partner uh, with this particular event and for the purposes that it's for. Um, we at the NBL, we really try to work with small women and minority-owned business on sustainability, on development, and actually with what's going on now, on getting yourself together so that you can get the loans and get the funding and get the resources that you deserve and need so that you can move forward with your endeavor. Um, you can always reach out to me. I will put my information in the chat. I am the business development manager. We do have several events going on. So I do encourage everyone to go to the mbl.org. Check out all of the events that we have going on. And if there's something that you want to be a part of, register, email me, reach out to me directly, and I'll make sure that you can get and take advantage of the resources that we offer. But thank you, Mel, for what you all do. And thank you, everyone, for moving this community forward in business. Thank you. Thank you so much, Micah, for sharing. Um, next up, we have our featured speaker for today's Lunch and Learn, Robert Linconis, the Executive Director of the Credit Restoration Institute. Robert, the floor is yours. Thanks, Melody. Um, I've been fixing credit for the majority of my adult life. And a lot of, uh, a lot of people on this call might know me from an organization called SCORE. That's part of the SBA. Um, I, I've been the, a SCORE mentor for uh, well, I teach the credit course on personal credit and business credit for the last seven years. Um, I, I, I met Chandra about that time when, with Pat Foster in the city of Richmond's Minority Business Development, the very first city of Richmond financial conference. Um, Chandra and I were both at that conference um, teaching at our respective professions. Um, credit. Credit is important because without good credit, you won't be able to take advantage of opportunities. You won't be able to, you won't be able to qualify for additional capital that you need to grow um, with lower interest rates. Uh, a good credit is important. Credit is money. Credit is money because by not having good credit, you're you 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 miss out. Um, I guess from a business credit building perspective, um, business credit is different from personal credit. And we can go into a lot of details, but the time that we have this morning, well, this afternoon, isn't going to allow us to do a deep dive into the mechanics of how to build a strong, robust business credit profile. But I'd like to go into the details of exactly how to do it. It's starting with how is your business set up? And Chandra is fantastic about sitting down Virginia Community Capital and, and making sure okay, is, is the business properly registered with the State Corporation Commission if you're a corporation, either an LLC, an S Corp, C Corp, if that's how your uh, CPA like Celia might direct you to structure your business. But 
First, the business has to be set up correctly. Uh, it has to be registered with the State Corporation Commission. They have to have, of course, a uh, IRS EIN number, employer identification number. Business credit is built on your employer's identification number, not your social security number in some cases. Uh, in some cases, you might be required to co-sign for business credit, but that be, that, that, that's okay as your business is starting and developing and as the specific need arises, you might have to uh, show collateral or whatnot. Um, good personal credit, is going to be a requirement for getting any type of substantial amounts of business credit, regardless of the type. Um, Valerie, if you wouldn't mind switching the next slide, please, just to go into just 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 some basics, and uh, I'm going to go into how real credit works uh, in, a, in a in a in a minute. But of, of course, the bet if you have credit issues, I'm going to take teach you how to fix the issues. Um, my company, we have an attorney on staff. His name is Jason Crumbine. Him and I have been together now for, gosh, going on 11 years. And I'm the FICO expert. I'm the credit score expert. My, my area of specialty is how to get people approved for things. How do I actually have you go from where you are to where you want to be? And that's a very, I've, I've, I've done this thousands of times. Anyone who would seek to talk further after this meeting, obviously, you know, I, we're, we, we would welcome one-to-ones um, moving forward, which I would love to help every single person in this, um, in, in, in this meeting. But good credit gives you lower interest rates, qualify for better options, higher approval odds, more negotiating power, the benefits of repairing your credit. Now, how, how do you repair your credit? The first thing is, is you need to look at your credit reports. Um, right now, annualcreditreport.com, because of the pandemic, is allowing weekly free credit reports. And if you type in annualcreditreport.com, the real website's way down at the bottom of the page. There's a lot of credit monitoring services trying to solicit uh, your business at the top of that. But order your credit reports. You need to order all three. Uh, the three credit bureaus are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion that financial institutions look at uh, in order to determine uh, approval odds and uh, lending decisions. Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. You want to order each report. You want to lay them out side by side on your table or a desk. Compare trade lines, and you want to look at what might be different across the three bureaus. Now, this is this is things. These are things that anybody can do on their own, and this is 101 right here. Look for. Anything that possibly is number one, not yours. Inaccurate information can be disputed. If you don't recognize something, everything on a credit report has to have three components. Number one, it has to be 100% accurate. Number two, it has to be 100% verifiable by the data furnisher, the source that reported it originally to the credit bureaus. Uh, and three, it has to be within the statute of limitations, which is seven years from the last active date. What you're looking for very specifically as far as last active date is, is this creditor continuing to report, let's just say charged off every single month for the last three years when the last active date of last activity was in 2019? How could the seven year statute start if it's reporting derogatory charged off in collection every single month for, for, for years? since it, there was the last active date on that account. That's one of the things that we sue over because there's no magic wand to make anything true, complete and accurate come off of a credit report. But there's a huge legal difference between 99% accurate and 100% accurate. Valerie, if you wouldn't mind switching the slide, please. The Fair Credit Reporting Act is what the, the one of the pillars of how real credit repair works. There's no magic wand to make anything true, complete, and accurate come off. But this is my version of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. We've got a whole lot of notes in here. And notes are how real lawsuits get written. 
what is truly inaccurate on a credit report is how we're going to fix the items on your report after you've disputed the issues on your own and they've come back, let's just say not resolved because anything not true, complete and accurate is inaccurate, it's unacceptable. And that's how we build the foundation of a Fair Credit Reporting Act violation lawsuit against either the credit bureaus, collection agencies, data furnishers, the banks, finance companies, whoever will not change inaccuracies to be accurate or remove the item. Either way, I mean, that's, that's an acceptable alternative to correcting the item. This is real credit repair, how real credit repair works. Building credit is another requirement to repairing credit. Making bad stuff go away is just, just half of, of, of um, someone just asked, how do you stop them from reporting that every month? <laughs> the lawyer might need to get involved. <laughs> or if the item's accurate, and let's just say it's a, it's a negative balance, we need to make a settlement or some sort of a payment plan or a deal to stop the bleeding, so to speak, because that's really what it is. It's violating the Fair Credit Reporting Act for a creditor to just hit charge off, charge off, charge off every month for years. Um, the statute to sue is three years from the last active date before a, 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 a finance company bank can get a judgment against you and then proceed for garnishment. Once the judgment is filed and obtained, they, uh, the finance company has 10 years to seek garnishment from that point, and then that can be renewed for an additional 10. So it's really best if you know the debt's yours and it's been verified as accurate. You go on to say, let, let's, ex for example, Experian's website, their, their, their little mobile app has an awesome free service. It's a very good uh, dispute tool on there. And let's just say it comes back verified as accurate. Okay. It's... Um, um, can say if it's paid it paid off in full after the charge off, but they continue to report it, uh, it shouldn't be. It would not continue to report if there's a zero balance that the creditor has no reason to report it. If it's a zero balance, then there's no credit reporting that happens moving forward. It stops from that point, but that's not necessarily the last active date of the account. So you would want to go back to the original. Now, now, of course, paying it or settling it creates an activity that then that's the last active date. It brings a, it brings a point, a credit repair technique in many cases, if it's an older debt, um, if it's an older debt, we might not want to pay it because re-aging, say a six and a half year old collection account from six and a half years old to now December or November of 2021 with a zero balance could lower the score. And when we get into the mechanics of the, of the credit score, um, we'll get into some detail on this. And and just and Celia has a lot to cover too, by the way. So I'm, I can get long winded. Melody, if you wouldn't mind, maybe kind of kind of slow me down because <laughs> Celia's got about the same amount of material to cover. <laughs> so it's, okay. So just um, but 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 I'm I'm passionate about credit. I am passionate about credit repair because bad credit, essentially the big machine keeps people down because the credit bureaus are all publicly traded corporations. Um, actually, Valerie, good time for the next slide. The credit bureaus are publicly traded corporations um, and the banks purchase credit reports by the millions every day. Notice Experian, look at the bottom right hand, well, the right hand a little bit down, revenue one or $5.179 billion in 2020 is how much Experian made, $5.179 billion selling credit reports, selling all of our data that they've collected about us. And we, we are both the credit bureau's customer and commodity. And that's, we, but without it, we would not be able to go into a dealership and 30 minutes later, as an example, drive out with a vehicle having put no money down on it. 
I mean, <laughs> you can't you, you can't go to Chandra and get any type of a loan with Virginia Community Capital without good credit to where they can predict the risk of repayment. And that's what all the FICO score is, is the risk of uh, is, is predicting the likelihood of future repayment risk. Experian, $5.179 billion, and their biggest customers are the banks and more publicly traded corporations. Their biggest customers spend the majority, this $5.179 billion, other services are part of that money, that revenue, but selling credit reports is the bulk of it. And they have no interest in changing their procedures to the detriment of their biggest customers. And unfortunately, this is the world we live in. So my passion is helping people who are being uh, under this type of system get out from, get, you know, get, get, uh, get a little bit of relief at least, if not get completely um, empowered by not having credit problems. Um, uh, next slide, please, Valerie. We'll get into some credit scores and then um, I'm gonna try to start wrapping a lot of this up so Celia can, can go. FICO. FICO, notice the exact same thing. One revenue, $1.295 billion in 2020. Selling credit scores. Every time a FICO score is computed, FICO gets a royalty, you know, fractions of a cent, times millions per hour, adds up to $1.295 billion <laughs> for fair eyes. Fair Isaac, if you notice at the very bottom, 4,003 employees in 2020. 4,003 employees in that nice building right there. What do they do? <laughs> Walk around? <laughs> well, what, a, what the FICO data scientist does is predict risk. Uh, there's a new version of every FICO score created every two years because the like because the FICO score predicts the likelihood of one or more trade accounts on your credit report going into default into the next 24 months. And it's weighted very heavily the previous 24 months, even though the history, derogatory history stays on for seven years. Good credit stays on for 10 years. This is on a consumer report. <clears throat> but what's funny is the data never really goes away. Even if the item is disputed and it comes off of the consumer report, either due to one or more reasons, all of that data stays in FICO's, well, it, 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 the, the credit bureaus, because the FICO score is computed on the data that's fed into the scoring algorithm to spit out a score. But the data never really goes away. And this is the, the funny part about all of it. Um, well, Nothing ever really goes away on the internet anyway. I'm, I won't get into that. We don't have the time. So. But, my, but my point is you have to understand the score because this is big business and this is uh, credit affects all of our lives. It's going to affect your businesses. It's going to affect how you're able to take advantage of opportunities, how, you, how you're able to budget, how you're able to save, how you're able to pass along wealth to future generations. Everything has to do with credit. Um, next slide, Valerie, please. And this is my last slide. And we'll try to wrap some of this up. Um, if you hit it one more, maybe so the words come up. Actually, you know what, Valerie, can you take it off of PowerPoint and put me on the full screen? This might be a little bit better. All right. <laughs> the FICO score has five major components. 35% uh, of the credit score is your history. All of your history, positive, negative, uh, your names, possible incorrect previous addresses. 15% is age of credit. The previous 24 months predicts the likelihood of the next 24 months possibly going into derogatory within the next 90 days. Mix of credit, inquiries. An inquiry has a negative factor between zero and five points every time a hard credit pull is done. Hard credit pull means when Chandra pulls your credit report, that's a financial decision possibly being made on that credit inquiry. Therefore, uh, the score looks at it as you're seeking to purchase, seeking credit. So the more inquiries, the lo lower the score goes, but you're allowed three of them per year. 
um, it, this was increased from two to three just recently because of the CARES Act. Three per year would be considered normal uses of credit. Now that could go back down to two. But if a thinner credit file, meaning a newer credit file, it, an inquiry hurts the score more. 30% of the score is revolving credit utilization. For example, the amount of credit on your credit cards that you've used as compared to your credit limits. Anything over 50% of your limit starts to hurt the score on sort of a bell curve, at, whereas maxing a credit card out, it's almost better that you didn't even have the card if you max it out. But as business owners, we know life happens and you need to use the credit sometimes for emergencies because you're not going to not make payroll. Don't get me on all that either. But objectively, you want to keep the balances as low as possible. You want proper credit card management involves knowing when the statement on your credit card ends. The statement end date, the balance on the statement end date is what's reported to the credit bureaus when that finance company reports to the credit bureaus. So you can use whatever you have to do, divert money, whatnot, get that credit card paid down, then the statement ends, then you could go ahead and max it out the day after if you need to. This is just credit card management, tips and advice. Um, this is the FICO score. Vantage, which is what you see on all of the credit monitoring services, Credit Karma, as an example, is a competing brand to FICO. And the Vantage score is very close to be, being acceptable by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for a 30-year mortgage. So we might see a competing score to FICO in the mortgage industry in the next couple of years. <sighs> okay. <laughs> now, Chandra has a lot, to, or, I'm sorry, Celia has a lot to cover. Um, Melody, do you want to do questions now or later? It's up to No, I'll, I want to go ahead and let Celia add mm -hmm. to the conversation and then at 12.40, we will start to welcome because the questions, as you can imagine, as you've anticipated, have been coming through. <laughs> All Valerie, right. Valerie, as you see, beyond this particular slide starts Celia's presentation. Thank you. Robert, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to this conversation this afternoon. And thank you, Robert, for partnering with me in this uh, venture. I am going to talk about, well, what happens either before or after we need credit restoration. And this is my area of expertise in that we are gonna discuss some of the key financial management principles. Valerie, if you can advance the slide, I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. We all have to recognize that things are gonna happen. And many of our small businesses and big businesses also fail because of failure of good financial management. And these next areas that I'm going to discuss with you, many of you know about this, I'm sure, but just a refresher and just getting back to the basics. Once we've done all the hard work that we have done with restoring our credit and getting our businesses operated, what do we do after that? And the first area of success that I encourage small business owners to focus on is budgeting. So Valerie, if you could please advance the slide. Let's talk a little bit about what budgeting can do for you in your business. Well, the first thing is get real. It will help us get real when we practice sound budgeting. And when we provide a very realistic picture of our business goals and our objectives, that is a must. That is the foundation that we have to begin to operate from. And typically our budget is gonna be stated in financial terms. This is nothing that is a secret from anyone, but I have to say it, we have to put this in financial terms. And one of the good outcomes is that it's gonna keep us accountable to our business plans, it keeps us focused, keeps us directed, and it also controls our cash flow. All of this is integral to building your credit and restoring and building your business. And then lastly, our budget allows us to look back historically to see how we have performed, and then gives us the opportunity to make adjustments. Valerie, if you can advance, I surely would appreciate it. 
let's talk a little bit about cash flow. This is the second key principle. And this is one that I have seen and I have observed where a lot of organizations and small businesses fail, fail to look at. We need to know where our money is moving to and from because money moves in cycles and patterns. And we have the ability to establish those cycles and patterns in our businesses. And cash flow, monitoring that is key. It keeps our business operating. Because many of you know, you if you need to operate and you need to go and have credit to help you get a line of credit, we're going to need to know where that cash flow is going to have to happen. And what cash flow also more importantly allows for us to do, it is our window to the future. It allows us to plan where a lot of us get stuck. We can get the budget pra practice going, but that ability to look at the future, to see what those needs are, the projects that we want to initiate, it really helps us plan for the future. And it also allows us to make sound business decisions because when we look ahead and we can see that we may not be able to meet operations, we need to be able to go and ask somebody for some funding possibly. So this is just a guidance tool. Valerie, next slide please. And this is a very huge issue that I see. And I know a lot of us have experienced this particular principle. And that is, uh, I say, paying on to Caesar, but basically is our taxation. Our taxation is one of the number one problems after credit restoration that small business owners run into. And partly because there is poor planning, poor planning in the area of taxes will hinder your business's growth. And usually taxes are not on the forefront of our minds or top of mind until a problem arises. When we get that notice from one of the tax agencies, that's when we call our accountant. But being ahead of that game is going to help us move forward. Also, being in that situation is very stressful as I'm sure some of you have experience and we want to avoid that stress because that is not helpful to either our self-care or our business care as well. And lastly, which is a very difficult task to do is to break cycles of poor tax handling. Those situations can go on for years. So getting ahead and having a plan to make sure that your taxes are paid typically on time, saves you a lot of money, and building that into your budget and into your cash flow will definitely help your financial management. Next slide, Valerie. Reporting. This is the pillar of how a business needs to get information on how they are performing. And when we are looking at reporting, we're looking at systems that give us information that's easy to read. We don't need to be a CPA or a MBA, but we should be able to read financial statements and we should have systems in place that allow us to do that very easily. Our reporting mechanisms keep us informed and we need to do it consistently on an ongoing basis. One of the areas that I have seen in my experience is that this is an area that falls short. And many times it falls short because small business owners are so busy running their business, working in their business, that this area often goes overlooked. But by the time that they are paying attention, it's typically at the end of the year, they're getting ready to file their taxes. And so, Decisions that they could have made earlier by reviewing their financials and their reports could have saved them some money and stress and so forth. So I encourage out of all of the recommendations that you, if you are not implemented 
or have are you planning to implement a good financial reporting system? Again, easy to access. And knowing when to make decisions is another area that will help keep your business in the green. Many times, again, we make decisions that are a little bit behind. And at that time that we make them, we don't have enough time for course correction. So giving yourself time by regularly monitoring your financial performance on an ongoing basis will keep you abreast of where you are financially. And also when you apply for funding or grants or business loans, you'll have the mechanisms in place to provide the information that these entities and financial institutions will require of you. So financial reporting can stress that enough. One of the uh, foundations of sound financial management. And I think that's gonna be my last slide. Mine was pretty, pretty, pretty easy going. Oh no, I have one last, one last bit of information. So where do we get the solutions for all of this? We need to engage what I call your business's dream team. And it starts with your accountant, your attorney, financial planner, getting a banker that you can work with on an ongoing basis and establishing a relationship is key and an insurance agent. These are the key professionals that really round out that advisory team that you need that you may not be able to afford on an ongoing basis, but establishing these relationships will be key to the future of your business's success. Valerie, I think that might, oh, and my contact information is um, in this presentation. You'll have access to me. Also, I'm offering, if you go to my website and you want to have a 20 minute consultation. You can go to my website and you can book a free consultation with me if you care to have a conversation beyond this presentation. And I thank you. I hope that was short and sweet um, and it, it met the needs of the, of, of, of the workshop today. Thank you so much, Celia and Robert. That's very kind and generous of you to make that offering to our attendees. So. I thank you so much um, for making that available. Um, you know, you both provided us with so much valuable information and credit on credit restoration tips, I should say, so that our attendees are able to take the next steps, essentially in establishing a strong credit profile. So attendees, I know I, I don't even have to say don't be shy because I see the questions in the Q&A box <laughs> and I also see them in the chat. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start. Um, we'll start with the Q&A box. And I will present both questions, Robert and Celia, so you two can decide who wants to answer. The first question is, how would we know if a creditor continues reporting every single month? The way, the way to know is when you get your credit reports and you look at, um, well, can't really see. Well, uh, all, right, all right, looking at a credit report, let's just say you go to annualcreditreport.com, download, and then save as a PDF the reports to your computer, and you're looking at the reports in side-by-side -side format. There's a what's called a payment history <clears throat> tab, which is usually either at the bottom or to the right, depending on the credit report format, that shows the payment history for the previous 24 months. Now, if you see a negative item, that's been reporting every single month, either CO, which stands for collection or charge off, it could stand for either, every single month, then that's an issue. But you would look at, let's just say November of 2021's history, then October, September, et cetera, to the previous November of 2019. The previous 24 months of history are what's displayed on a consumer report. Um, some more detailed reports show you the entire seven years. Or in the case of good credit, it stays on for 10 years from the last active date. But let's say you have a, uh, you know, my wife, J.C. Penney's car that's 30 years old, <laughs> practically. <laughs> well, all right, there should be 30 years of payment history. As long as provided it's paid as agreed, there should all be 
a code number one, you know, Chandra note. The, um, um, the payment history codes are either a code number one, which means paid or paying as agreed. That's both payment status and account status. A code two is a 30 day late. A three is a 60, a four is a 90, all the way up to eight, which is critical action started and a nine, which stands for charge off or repossession or foreclosure or uh, critical action basically is what a nine status is. So a one status should show paid or paying as agreed. Now you would look at the monthly dates to determine, okay, was I paid as agreed during that time or was I not? Does Equifax show something different from Experian shows? Why should there anything not be showing in the payment fields? Missing payment history hurts you because you don't have advantage of that one status for that particular month and year. All of it helps. Proper credit repair involves, yes, making bad stuff go away by showing the inaccuracies, building your case of how you, how you just want accuracy on your report, uh, and then document all that paper trail because if it doesn't work come see me and we'll have a conversation on whether we have some sort of a suit or not which that's the fun part of credit repair is suing these companies they have no problem threatening to sue you <laughs> guarantee you that so so, it's, it's, so we're we're the anti-collection agency that's kind of what we are so anyway did i answer the question <laughs> yes you did and i appreciate it i'm going to head over to the next question what should um what should it change to after a when you have a charge off? Mm -hmm. um, I guess how should that show? I'm I'm, a, I'm trying to interpret interpret the question. Um, what is what should change on your credit report um, if you have a charge off? Okay, if an item's been charged off, uh, um, let's just say a credit card, and it goes into default, um, is actually charged off the bank or finance company who issued the charge uh, issued the credit card um, receive some sort of compensation either they they have insurance on their receivables they receive uh, they, they could write it off on tax returns they could use it still keep it on their books as a receivable which then they take revenue loans on there's all kinds of different ways a bank can use that particular asset but a charge off, you would think logically, okay, they charged it off. They received compensation for that. How come it's still being reported on my credit credit report? And, and the answer, the literal answer to the question is, how should it show on the credit report? It would say charged off. Now, how that's interpreted, if there's a balance on it and it's been charged off, that kind of doesn't really make sense. So the first initial dispute is why is it charged off with a balance? You know, did did you receive compensation once you charged this off? Why is it quote unquote charged off? Is really the first dispute. It comes back, yes, it's verified as accurate. It's charged off. Really not telling you anything about um, uh, your initial dispute. Then you would have to look at if it's been reporting charged off every month for the last two years. That's an illegal action. Fair Credit Reporting Act violation cannot be charged off more than one time, but an attorney is not going to sue over it. It's a violation. Yes, it's a violation. But is it yours? If we and I've been involved in, I'm I'm an, I'm, a, I'm an expert witness as far as how we can quantify actual damages of the credit reporting in a lawsuit. That's how FCRA law works. Um, and, and, and my job would be to figure how you were really damaged by that inaccurate reporting. And lawsuits don't just flip a switch and you file a lawsuit either. E even using a big, long template where you fill in the spaces, it still takes a paralegal a good couple, three hours to draft a proper lawsuit. What are we suing over specifically? And then it's a filing fee, $500 filing fee in federal circuit court to file the lawsuit to make the bureaus have to show up. And, and then it isn't even, it, it doesn't even get to that point. Um, Jason and, and the lawyer from Equifax will sit there and have a phone conversation of how to work this out. And the lawyer from Equifax will say, okay, I need to, I need to, we need to wait a couple of weeks so I can justify 35 hours at 200 some dollars an hour to bill Equifax, and then I'll let you win. 
<laughs> and then that's that's really how the legal system goes in credit reporting. It rarely actually goes to court. Uh, in some cases, it does, especially in larger settlements. That's how the attorneys get paid. They get a percentage of damages recovered. But incorrect reporting would sometimes it's a better better path of least resistance to just go ahead and settle the account, especially if it's uh, if you know it's yours, okay, yes, the interest and fees have ballooned the original balance to a lot higher than what it really should be, which is another violation, FDCPA violation there. But then again, back to, we aren't just going to spend, it's cheaper sometimes to just work out a deal. Then when a payment plan's in place or a settlement has happened, then it's much easier for me to get that thing off your credit report when you don't owe them anything. And then all of the multiple charge off tags will get those off, if not the entire trade line, if not, uh, well, well, we would want to you know, get, get the whole thing off if it's a negative account and it's not 100% accurate. Because remember, there's no magic to make true, complete and accurate anything come off. But most of the time pressure points, path of least resistance is to make us go away. And that's just part of credit repair. Thank you so much, Robert. The next question is, what are some financial systems uh, to, that you'd recommend for small businesses or how for them to grow, I guess, to manage their business? And I think this is an area that kind of Celia yep. uh, touched on. Yeah. So if there are any, there's any type of um, financial systems that you would recommend for them to be able to manage, you know, from their home. Um, sure. That be? We have a couple of options. Um, there is an app called FreshBooks, which is totally free. And I always opt for free when we're small businesses first. Very easy to use. You can do payroll, your billing, your reporting. So FreshBooks would be the first one that I would recommend. The second would be QuickBooks. And if you are a self-employed individual, QuickBooks has an app feature that's specific to self-employment and both of these apps, both of these systems can be used from your phone, especially the QuickBooks self-employed. So those are two that I would recommend, easy setup and um, you'll be ready to go if you know if you begin to implement within you know 30 minutes possibly. So try those. Thank you, Celia. I actually never heard You're of welcome. FreshBooks. So that is a gem that you've just provided because I do appreciate, you know, providing the option of a free resource, you know, That's for right. those that are not able to. So thank you. I've never heard of Fresh You're welcome. So I, I just wrote that down. I've been taking notes too. So this is great. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. All right. Yeah. So we have a stream. I want to, I'm going to try to get through as many as possible within the next 10 minutes tops. Um, okay. Okay. Um, how do we stop the credit bureaus from? I'm sorry. What if it's paid? What if the the account is paid off in full after the charge off, but they continue to report it? It it it. it, it the only way a a institution would report anything is if it, it, it is if it had something to report. Um, for example. If, okay, let's just define what it means. If it's a, let's just say an, a, a credit card or an account that is open, as an example, instead of closed slash or, or, or charged closed because of being charged off or settled in full, if it's an open account, then that financial institution will report hopefully a one status paid or paying as agreed every single month to the credit bureau meaning at that particular month, then that account is open. So if it was in default and it was settled, Capital One does this all the time. They'll love, they'll, you could have a charged off credit card or a Capital One repossession, and then they're still barraging you with credit card pre-approvals because they know that more people will take advantage of this very high interest rate credit card use it, max it out pretty much, pay minimum payments for X number of period of months or years before it gets charged off again. So it's still a profit deal for them to give that person another credit card. 
um, that's where behavior comes in. That's why Celia and I's main, our whole focus is on, you know, be smart with your money. <laughs> credit is money. If you max out a credit card, you know, that interest every single month is just tick, 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 tick. But yes, we understand life happens. And if you have to use your revolving credit, you have to do it. And if you're not going to not put food on the table. And Thanksgiving's coming up. Christmas is coming up. You're going to use your, you're, you're not going to not use it, but you have to weigh that with discipline also. And you have to weigh that with future forward thinking also. Years ago, back, um, as this is going to date myself, back from uh, in the 80s, my first line of credit was with Circuit City. And I promptly drove in there, wanted a car stereo, and they gave it to me. I was a kid. I was 18, I think. Some, yeah, some, I had to be 18. And so, but, but still not really. Uh, you know, had, um, my head was still wanting the car stereo. And so, and I promptly defaulted on that line of credit. <laughs> A thirty-two dollar a month payment. I I need that thirty-two dollars. That's that was my whole thought, and that's usually how kids nowadays are still they're they're not forward thinking. But as adult business owners, we have to. We've hopefully matured to the point that if you're where you're now starting a business, that's not like that. That's taking a big leap of faith right there, just in itself. And you don't do that before you've gotten to the emotional mature level of being able to use some self-discipline on your credit also. And that's what Celia and I both preach as far as uh, a holistic program to make sure that you get from where you are now to where you want to be, which is, which is our mission. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, the next question is, how do you get rid of previous years um, of bad reporting? Is it wise to go ahead and file bankruptcy? Um, well, it depends. Um, um, filing bankruptcy, a chapter 13 is a payment plan. A chapter seven is a hit the reset and wipe everything out. And that depends on the bankruptcy trustees qualifications if you qualify for a chapter seven. But a bankruptcy is going to, a chapter seven is going to stay on your credit report for 10 years from the filing date. Chapter 13 will stay on it seven years from the filing date. will stay on your credit reports. In many cases, you cannot get a mortgage <clears throat> until the bankruptcy is a specific number of years old. And I think it's two or three. I'm not a mortgage loan officer. but it, so, so you're stuck not being able to take advantage of these super low housing interest rates by filing bankruptcy. Now, if it's just bad credit, not necessarily with balances, just, just a bunch of bad stuff, then dispute the accuracy of the items first, go back and forth a few times. If, if, if things, some things might get removed in the dispute process, but do a few rounds of work first and then come see, see me and my team and let us look at your situation at this point. We are an alternative to bankruptcy. I don't, unless it's a dramatic amount, a large amount of defaulted debt, or even debt that isn't in default, that you but debt that you have that you cannot actually pay. We'll, we'll first talk about debt management options. What can, we, can, what can we do to help you kind of relieve the stress and get some breathing room with, um, say, a debt management program? Or we'll, if I look at something and it's such a dramatic amount of defaulted debt, then I will refer you to one or more of my bankruptcy attorney partners. But the, the answer specifically is, should you file bankruptcy? I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm not a bankruptcy. Bankruptcy attorney or attorneys are bankruptcy salespeople, by the way, too. When you sit and talk with one of them, their objective is to hook you into that bankruptcy. So keep that in mind also. And there's nothing wrong with salespeople. We're all basically in sales anyway. <laughs> We're selling something, <laughs> whether it's ourselves or whether it's our programs, whatever it is. There's nothing wrong with bankruptcies, but you got to be you only have a few thousand dollars of you don't that's how much the bankruptcy is going to cost and then now you're stuck with a bankruptcy for either seven or ten years so be careful when listening to the bankruptcy people but always take advice from a good bankruptcy law firm such as bowman or pia pia north is a good friend of mine north and associates on um hell street thank you so much i think we have room for one more question 
um, what's the best way to take care of not being able to answer identity verification questions due to inaccuracies that you can't even see yourself? Hmm. You want to take a stab at that one, Celia? <laughs> that is not in my bailiwick. That's not in my wheelhouse. <laughs> I, 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 I already hear the, the, the answer to that question is um, the identity questions that credit monitoring services ask to verify your identity before you get a credit report come from your credit reports. If you've had identity theft possible and different previous addresses or accounts that aren't yours might be on your reports that they're asking security questions um, uh, th that they're asking security questions on. Um, here, 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 here's, here, here's, here's the answer to, to that. And this happens before too. If it says security question, what street, what, what previous address have you previously been associated with? And let's just say you lived at 1234 West Broad Street as an example, but then it just says broad, the word broad, M main, broad, grace, Okay, just because it doesn't say Broad Street, that's the answer. If it says, when was my previous student loan, uh, what's the payment on my student loans, and you know you don't have any student loans, then that's an acceptable, not applicable answer, letter D. If it says, um, well, which, what's the balance on your current credit card and it gives you certain dollar amounts. If if you don't know that off the top of your head, that's okay to kind of default it. Most monitoring services, if you if you if you answer the security questions wrong, give you maybe an additional couple of more questions. The other answer is you pick up the phone and call them and say, look, I, I don't know what what's going on. Can you open my account? Here's my information. I want to get my credit report. Can we what what do we do here? I'm not your security question things uh, is acting crazy. <laughs> Can you ask me some more questions <laughs> and get somebody on the phone and, and try and push it through that way? I'm going to squeeze one more in. If we can do this fire round response, because I think this will be incredibly beneficial, this, this question to many on the call. How does a new business or a business that does not have a history build one? Is it to get one of the credit card offers? Um, yeah, yeah, that's exactly how to do it. A new business is similar to an 18 year old with no credit. Uh, and the young adult will have to establish credit somehow, which means either an authorized user account from a parent or relative, or as in the business's case, co-signer from the business owner. Now, if the business owner has uh, high utilization on their personal credit because they've used it all to get business to where they're at at that point that they're now thinking about business credit. Um, actually, actually, um, um, do we get a card in the business's name? Yes. Um, and, and talk to Chandra about all that. <laughs> and she'll hook you up on everything to do with kind of getting the business started. That's uh, yeah, yeah, I can chime in on that. I would recommend uh, definitely in some financial institutions, you are pre-qualified for a business credit card or pre business credit line when you establish a checking account. So please take advantage of that. Utilize that. Another way to establish credit is not going to be on your credit report, but there is something called a Dunn's number and Dunn and Bradstreet. So you want to make sure that you are utilizing um, suppliers. Like if you are using uh, Staples and Office Max and those places, make sure you use those uh features and have business accounts at all possible times, open a business account. Do not commingle it with your personal and that helps you establish credit. So um, that is one way to build that credit. Um, and it, like I said, at all possible, even sometimes you have to do a secured option, you know, if you have some credit issues that we're talking about today. So some banks offer secured credit cards. Do that where you're, you're holding cash on deposit, to secure the credit card or a secure line of credit until you get to a point where you are have a, improved your credit and then they can eliminate the cash, give that back to you if you if you pay it as agreed. Um, so those are some tactics and strategies you can do to establish credit. I hope I answered that question for you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you know, we're we're hopeful that all of our attendees are going to be leaving this lunch and learn feeling more empowered and confident so that you can begin implementing some of these credit building strategies offered today. 
Um, at the beginning of the session, I did mention um, we are going to share some information on capital resources that are, we have available through Virginia Community Capital. And so Shandra just finished cool. speaking, <laughs> um, and I wanted to introduce her. Um, yeah. She is our VP of Economic Equity, Small Business Loan Officer. She is going to share a little bit with you on the Economic Equity Fund, um, provide her contact information. If you are in need of a capital um, injection in your business, um, we have a resource that we're hopeful to get out to many of you that are on the call. Yeah. Well, thank you, Melanie. And as um, Robert said, you know, we've both been around for a while. I've been in the industry for about 29 years and been with Virginia Community Capital since September. And just excited to be a part of the equity um, economic equity fund. It was established and in 2020, it's about $10 million fund. And we did this because we recognized that BIPOC businesses was that's black, uh, indigenous, and people of color and women-owned business were disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, and we know historically um, our businesses typically don't have the necessary documentation that Cecilia mentioned, you know the QuickBooks, the, uh, the balance sheet, income statement, profit and loss statements, you know, accounts receivable. We need to make sure we provide that technical assistance to help you get bank ready, right? And be able to submit the necessary documentation for us to consider a loan for you. So the economic equity fund was developed for just that case to help you one with the technical assistance and also provide you with um, a capital injection or loan loss reserves if there's a shortfall in collateral or the guarantor is not as strong. So we have to develop the fund for that. Um, eligibility and what you can use the funds for, you can use it for business acquisition, debt refinance, equipment financing, owner occupied real estate, working capital lines of credit. So we can accommodate most of all of your financing needs. Um, as far as you being eligible for that, we're looking at businesses about 18 months in business located in Virginia um, and just showing a profit. So uh, I'm not going to be on the soapbox for too much longer, but showing a profit, make sure your CPA is, a, is showing income. You know, I know no one wants to pay taxes and you may have your CPA show that I made zero income. So you have to pay taxes. As both uh, Cecilia mentioned, cash flow is what pays back loans, right? So we need to make sure that your tax returns reflect that you've made revenues and you have income to support the loan that you're applying for. So make sure if you're having, if you have a CPA that's showing you no income, try to redirect them. We're starting in a new year. We're giving you some tips to take you into the new year to get you post COVID. We wanna make sure that you're showing income. So when you come to me, we can actually help you get to your next level. And we do have additional resources at VCC with um, Small Business Development Center and things like that to help you get, get you started. So um, so please, I think they're gonna put my um, information in the chat for you. Um, so you can reach out to me if you have any questions. And this was great information today, but if you want additional input or, um, you know, I'll be more than happy to, to talk to you uh, if you give me a call or shoot me an email. Hope I did that and we just a couple minutes it. over. Sorry you about that. You did it, you did it. I think you, you did it. So again, thank you. Celia, Robert, Chandra, and Micah um, for joining us today and sharing the resources with our attendees. Attendees, thank you so much for carving time out of your busy schedules um, to join us. This really says that you are really committed to investing in your business. The education continues, right? And so we're happy to continue to provide resources so that you can grow as entrepreneurs. We encourage you to stay connected to Virginia Community Capital so that you have access to the many resources and programming opportunities that we have available for small business. Um, we've mentioned our website, um, but you can also follow us on social media at Virginia Community Capital, all platforms. Until next time, have a great rest of your day and have a happy Thanksgiving holiday with your family. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right, thank you.